Hello, and welcome to the 26th annual Get Lit Festival. I'm Kate Peterson, Director of Get Lit Programs, a nonprofit organization housed within Eastern Washington University in Spokane. Our program is responsible for Get Lit, Washington State's longest running annual literary festival, which hosts readings, workshops, craft classes, panel discussions, and much more, featuring many talented writers from our region and beyond. The festival takes place this Thursday through Sunday, April 11th through the 14th, in many venues across Spokane and Cheney. And of course, we're super happy to be back with you in this virtual space as well. You can find a full schedule of events along with information about all of our festival authors by visiting our website, getlitfestival.org. Now I'd like to introduce GetLit's Assistant Coordinator, Liz Graves, who will tell us about today's event. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fiction and the Family. Today, Alma Garcia and Ashley Wurzbacher will read from their debut novels and have a conversation led by Amy Brooks, a second year MFA student at Eastern Washington University and a Get Lit Festival intern. Ashley and Alma are both authors of exciting debut novels that share themes of family, secrets, politics, womanhood, and what it means to truly belong. We are excited for you to hear from them today. Our first reader today is Ashley Wurzbacher. Ashley is the author of the novel, How to Care for a Human Girl, and the short story collection, Happy Like This, which won the John Simmons Short Fiction Award and was a New York Times Editor's Choice. In 2019, she was named one of the National Book Foundation's five under 35 honorees. Ashley's short stories have appeared in the Iowa Review, the Kenyon Review, Michigan Quarterly Review, and other journals. She earned her MFA from Eastern Washington University and her PhD in Literature and Creative Writing from the University of Houston. She currently lives in Birmingham, Alabama, and teaches creative writing at the University of Montevallo. Please welcome Ashley. Hi, um, and thanks so much for being here. Um, I am a longtime fan of Get Lit since my days in Spokane um, from 2008 to 2010, which I look back on very fondly and I'm always really, really happy and, and honored to be a part of the festival. Um, I'm going to read a short section from the middle of my novel, How to Care for a Human Girl. Um, it's about two sisters who are um, over a decade apart in age, who um, both experience simultaneous unplanned pregnancies and make very different decisions. Um, so I'll read from the middle where we see the sisters um, in uh, going to a museum together in, in Pittsburgh, where part of the novel is set, and it's close to where I grew up. Um, so to introduce the characters, we have older sister Jada. She's a psychology PhD student living and working in Pittsburgh. She's married. She's had an abortion at the beginning of the book. Um, but she has not told her husband or her younger sister, Maddie. Um, Maddie, meanwhile, is 19, um, going on 20, and lives uh, in rural Pennsylvania with her father. Um, she is also pregnant. She's visited a crisis pregnancy center where she's been fed some misinformation and given this little plastic um, fetus doll, which makes an appearance in this section. So you should know where that came from. Um, and she's visiting her sister in Pittsburgh. She's been doing some online dating. Um, and the other important thing you need to know about both of them is that their mother has died. Recently. So um, I'm going to read you this section where Jada um, finally tells Maddie about her own pregnancy and abortion experience. Okay. And we're in Maddie's point of view here. On Friday afternoon, she left her disappointing date with extremely different slash multidimensional and went to meet Jada at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. It was an outing Jada had proposed and Maddie figured she knew why to dip her into the swirling cosmopolis, to make her look at art and dinosaur bones so that she might realize Jada was right, 
There was a world out there, so many places to be explored, so many people to meet, so many things to see and make and learn. It was true that the commotion of campus was infectious, that as she moved among students and backpacks toward the museum with the help of her phone's GPS, which narrated in a British accent from her pocket, she felt the same pull she had on a long ago visit to State College to be part of something, a student body of which she might become an arm or a leg or just a humble pinky toenail. In the near distance loomed the Cathedral of Learning, on the top of which Jada had told her a peregrine falcon kept its nest. Along the sidewalk, groups of students handed out flyers and sold plates of food at tables covered in the names of causes and organizations. Maddie moved past them, shielding her eyes from the sun with her bandaged hand, surveying club names and Greek letters. At the end of a line of tables, a handful of boys in fraternity swag stood around a hot dog stand bearing a poster paper sign. Save the titties, one dollar wieners, proceeds fight breast cancer. Save the titties, one of the boys hollered into cupped hands. He caught Maddie's eye. Buy a wiener to save a titty? It occurred to Maddie that sometimes it is not the thought that counts. Sometimes it really is the gift, the gesture, and sometimes the gesture is all wrong. She stopped and stared at the boy, baseball cap on his head, the two-tailed loop of an awareness ribbon pinned to his chest. Behind him, his brothers and matching pins speared hot dogs from a charcoal grill and laid them with care like precious penises in store-bought buns. At home, Maddie had a pair of socks patterned with that ribbon. She had a pink umbrella with white polka dots and the ribbon in the form of a charm dangling from the handle. These things were supposed to give her hope or to give other people hope. But when she wore the socks or carried the umbrella, when she watched these college boys stuff cash into envelopes, she did not feel hopeful. She did not feel charitable. She felt selfish and empty, her performed awareness of the sick only underscoring her own healthiness and her mother gone, no matter how many wieners were sold. Her mother, walking down the road with milk bones in her pockets, feeding the dogs the neighbors let run loose and that sometimes followed her home, hung around the yard and stared through the screen door wanting in. Her mother, filling the yard and woods with plastic gemstones placed at the center of flowers or among blades of grass, pretending fairies sent them. It was too late for her mother, but Maddie dug into her bag for the wallet into which she'd been feed, feeding her payoff money, took out a 50, and held it out to the boy. He probably had a mother, she thought with resentment, handing over the bill. You want... 50 hot dogs? He asked. No, thank you, she said. Keep your wieners. Just take the money. At the museum, Maddie and Jada made their way through the Hall of Minerals and Gems, a gleaming reef, minerals like glittering brains, dick-shaped crystals, geodes full of hard candy, and into the halls of African and North American wildlife, full of taxidermized baby everythings feeding off their mothers. Most of the animals had been arranged into neat nuclear family units behind glass. The watchful papa antelope, head high, horns horny, mama antelope by his side, baby antelope suckling or at play. Jada walked slowly among the dioramas doing weird things with her hands and Maddie could tell she had something she wanted to say. How was your date? Jada asked. She had come from a meeting with her advisor and wore a cream-colored blouse and denim skirt, hair in a neat ponytail, feet in pointy-toed flats. Maddie did a thumbs down and blew a raspberry. He just kept summarizing movie plots, she said, but I'll keep looking. Jada frowned. I wish you wouldn't look at your situation as one a man can save you from. And while we're on the subject of looking for things, it's probably time you started looking for a job if you're going to stay here, that is. Behind glass, a pair of amorous zebras posed coquettishly, eyes locked and nostrils flared. One zebra's neck rested on the other's back where a saddle might go. The fetus doll bulged in Maddie's pocket. 
She focused on the glass in front of a termite mound, registered the fingerprints and nose prints there, and thought of the person who would clean them up. She moved close to the glass, took a corner of her shirt, and rubbed at the cloudy smears, but the fabric only moved the oil around. Again, she wondered if the things in this museum, combined with the swarm of students on the surrounding campus, were what Jada had in mind when she referred to the life of adventure Maddie might leave if she did not, if she did not have this baby. There were certain things out there, like blue whales or snow leopards, Mount Everest, the rings of Saturn that you just accepted, things you could see confirmed on Instagram or behind glass in museums like these animals, things you could point to on a map. Maddie had always acknowledged the existence of these out there things with a blind assurance much like faith. She did not need to see them to know that they were real. And then there were other things, the abstract things Jada and her mother and other people spoke of, options, opportunity, of which she could find no solid evidence or credible cartography. She wished someone could show her these, capture version photos of the versions of herself she might become if only she had the opportunity, photos taken by a paparazzi elsewhere in the multiverse where her other lives might already be playing out. What did Jada mean when she said that Maddie had her whole life to live? What was she doing now, if not living it? Was it really so superior to see a zebra in the wild instead of on social or in the hall of African wildlife where she could be safe and clean and where she could push a stroller? She paused in front of a water buffalo, globs of glue drool on its lips, feet sunk in muddy puddles. Someone made this, she realized, Someone arranged the drops of snot rimming the buffalo's nostrils just so. Someone caringly placed this patty of dung at the animal's feet. This extreme attention to detail, this willingness to tend to dead animals with the same gentle affection with which Maddie cared for real ones moved her almost to tears. Down the hall, the glass on one of the dioramas had been removed and a man in a surgical mask and cloth moccasins hunched on a wooden platform spray painting the pelt of a brown bear with a spray gun attached to a hose. And it dawned on Maddie that maybe this was what Jada meant for her to see. Not just the diorama, but its restoration. The fact that the occupation of brown bear diorama restorer existed, one of the many life paths that she had not been exposed to back home and that might expand her sense of the possibilities for her own future. Is that that doll in your pocket? Jada asked as they walked. A giraffe loomed over her shoulder. Maybe, Maddie saw an opportunity. Why did you get so upset about it the other day? Why was I upset by the creepy piece of propaganda you were given at a non-medical facility by people who don't know you, don't know what's best for you and are okay with misinforming you in order to manipulate you into having a baby? Maddie rolled her eyes. Yeah, that. Jada took a deep breath. There's something I want you to know, she said. A little while back, I got pregnant by accident. I missed a pill, and I didn't think it would be a big deal. Jada spoke slowly, looking directly at Maddie. I knew I wasn't ready for a child, and I couldn't tell Blake. I knew that if I told him I'd be having that baby one way or another, there would be no getting out of it. So I got out of it. So, Maddie said... So I had an abortion and I couldn't tell him because he'd hate me, probably leave me. So I figured better if I left him first. That's where I was when you showed up. Maddie's nose crinkled and she stopped walking. You had an abortion, even though you're married, even though your husband is rich. It was my decision, Jada said, and I stand by it. I didn't die and my intestines are intact and I'm not infertile. Blake is a good person, and I don't want to lie to him, but I felt like I had to, and here I am. She turned toward the glass where they'd stopped and addressed her words to some grizzlies tearing apart a salmon, its needly bones exposed and its tweezer mouth open. Sometimes I hate myself for the things I don't feel, she said, the things I don't want, and I don't want to hate myself or be ashamed. Maddie tried to keep the look on her face neutral, but she must have failed because after a few seconds, Jada said, 
What? Nothing. If you have something to say, say it. Fine. Maddie gestured at Jada's belly. It's just, you didn't even have an excuse. I don't need an excuse. It's my right. Maddie shook her head. It's not for you. It's for poor people, people who got raped, people who can't take care of kids. You can't, could. You had everything you needed. Well, Jada said, it was my choice. Maddie's heart was in her throat. She'd lost track of what she was upset about. Why are you telling me now? Why didn't you say something before? I wasn't ready. You didn't trust me. No, I didn't. And this is why. Maddie said, you want me to see what you did, so I'll feel like I can do it too. Yes, Jada said, because you can, because you aren't. She gestured to the hall around them, to a screaming sea lion in a glass case, a wild animal. You have the power to choose the life you want. Maddie turned her back to her sister and stared at some walruses posed in a painted seascape. She did not know how she felt or should feel about what Jada had said. Her feelings had become mush and her thoughts were not thoughts, but a whirling, wordless blur. She steadied herself, focused on the here and now, the objective yet uncanny fact of a walrus's bald head. It was the diorama's very hyper-realism that rendered them unrealistic. No intrepid traveler to the Arctic would see for herself the droplets of salt mist on the tusks of a live walrus or the precise texture of its mustache with its hairs like porcupine quills, or be able to pause to count the wrinkles in its skin while it stood frozen, modeling patiently, looking her in the eye. What might she be like as a mother? Maddie set aside the logistics, where she'd live, what to do about work, and tried to dream herself into the role. Perhaps there was an instinct deep within her, as there was in a walrus or a wildebeest that would rise to the occasion when the time came. And I will stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ashley. Our second reader is Alma Garcia. Alma's award-winning short fiction has appeared in Narrative Magazine, Phoebe, and the anthology Puro Chicanex Writers of the 21st Century. She is a past recipient of a fellowship from the Rona Jaffe Foundation, holds an MFA from the University of Arizona, and is a member of the Macondo Writers Workshop. Originally from El Paso, Texas, and later from Albuquerque, New Mexico, she has lived in Seattle since 2001, where she teaches fiction writing at Hugo House, offers her, offers her services as a manuscript consult, consultant, pardon me, and is a mentor for artists and writers with the Artist Up program. All That Rises is her first novel. Please welcome Alma. Thank you, everyone. I'm so happy to be a part of this and a part of Get Lit for the first time ever. So this is this is really exciting. Um, so uh, my novel, All That Rises, does take place in El Paso. Um, and it is the story of two neighboring families who um, don't realize that they are entangled with one another um, until they are, partly due to the observations of the, the um, Mexican domestic workers that work in their household. Um, and it essentially becomes a, a story of secrets, lies, and border politics. Um, so I'd, I'd like to read um, from, a, this is a multiple viewpoint novel, um, and I'd like to introduce you to the two main protagonists who, um, in interesting contrast, are both male. Um, so let me introduce you first to um, Huck Dupre, who um, has just learned, he thinks, that his wife has left him. Um, a note he received has led him to believe this. And so, and he has not told his children, his 16-year-old twins or his nine-year-old daughter. Instead, he takes them to the amusement park, as one does. Um, so this is what, what happens. <clears throat> Dad. Jordan appears at Huck's side in the log ride line. Mary Jane's dug into the ground, fists rammed under her armpits. We don't want this ride. We want to go on the roller coaster. He bores his gaze into hers, her brows hard set beneath the shag of her carroty hair, cheeks spattered with freckles, eyes as fierce and inky brown as Rose, Rose Marie's, but his fury seeps suddenly away. He kneels beside his youngest and says, honey. Jordan doesn't blink. Dad, get up. You're not proposing to me. 
He laughs. All right, have it your way. He scoops Jordan up, flinging her over one shoulder, arm pressing against the scissors of her legs, then up to the dock. She makes a soft whump as he drops her into the hollow log, bobbing beside them, then another as she throws herself against the far side to glare. He extends a hand toward the rear bench as if to say, after you, and knows even before the moment they dart eyes to each other that the twins will obey. Skylar steps in before Quinn. Birth order. The water is a cheerful shade of aqua like the painted channel beneath it and the brilliant sky above. The attendant, a pretty camel-eyed Mexican girl, even offers him a smile as she reaches for the safety bar over his head. He twists around in his seat to look back. The log jerks them all toward the sky. Below, people on burlap bags whoosh with joy down the hump of the potato sack slide. Skylar sways in the seat beside him. In profile, the girls all rosemary. The nose with its exotic arch, the generous lips, the point of the chin, even with the sharp blue-gray eyes he gave her and her matted pile of blonde sausages. Libertarian or not, Rosemary once told him she fantasized about slipping into Skylar's room at night and snipping her dreads off with Miguel's pruning shears. Stop staring at me, she mutters now. He straightens forward as they lurch into a covered chute, the sunlight disappearing, the water reeking of chlorine. His thighs begin to buzz numbly. The safety bar is set too low for him. Don't get your undies in a bunch. Skylar's seat creaks. Where's mom? I wouldn't know. Naturally. What's that supposed to mean? It means you never seem to know the important things. The log makes a short whoosh downward and they smack against an incline, water slopping it over the sides. Guess what? Huck strains against the bar. I'm not the only one in this family who... She left you, didn't she? Quinn's voice rings in the tunnel. Huck's heart pounds in his neck, in his teeth. Honestly, he's not sure. So, Quinn laughs through his nose. Were you screwing around on her or what? The log levitates as Huck wrenches himself around. The front of Quinn's shirt puckers in his fist. The log falls. A hand, who's a squash between Huck's body and his backrest. And as they crash onto the down ramp with a slosh, Jordan tumbles against him. And as he stiff arms her back to her seat, rolling onto one butt cheek, he tenses against the sudden stomach pulling, stomach lifting pull of gravity and the safety bar pops open over his thighs. He teeters over the side of the log, but before he can correct anything, decide anything, finish anything, stop anything, he's pushed. He doesn't know whose hands do it, but there it is, one hard, quick shove, then he tumbles through a bright burst of sunlight and smacks into the water. He's going under, under the thick aqua blue water smelling of toilet bowl cleaner. He's drinking it, choking on it. He kicks, fighting his way back to the surface, but his Tony llamas are soggy bricks on his feet, and he knows in a wordless, paralyzed moment that this is how he will meet his doom. Dad, his children shout. Hands grasp his slippery wrists and shirt sleeves. He's dragged by the armpits, cheek pressing the slime slick side of the car. He realizes then that the bottom of this pool meets his feet. The water is only chest high. Uh, on shore, pandemonium. Brake squealing, the electric decrescendo of lost power. Onlookers clog the dock area, shouting words he can't understand. The last thing he sees before passing out is Jordan, standing back from the crowd as she clutches his dripping hat. The truth of the matter is that Rosemary had always confused order with oppression. It defied all natural law. She'd once been one of those creatures who make Texas college sororities possible. Dallas girls, extravagantly hairsprayed and manicured, who go to church on Sundays after Saturday night beer benders, leaving the alarms of their sports cars to howl in the dormitory parking lots. Pre-wed is what you called a girl like that not to mention seriously out of his league. This was the oil money lubricated playing field of Southern Methodist U after all. Though as he passed her on the lawn of Northrop Hall, he couldn't resist the challenge he saw in the well-groomed arch of her eyebrow. She'd snorted at his introduction and asked whether he was planning an epic rafting trip down the Mississippi. He'd cackled with the pleasure of his surprise. Still, he didn't reveal his real name, Harold, until he passed it, paid his first visit to the house that made him think plantation as he passed between its two white pillars. By that time, though, he'd removed his shoes in the foyer and received the stiff parental handshakes and the appraising glances of the two black women who served them a roast beef dinner followed by a bourbon pecan pie. Of course he was embarrassed by the way they all watched him handle the silverware, but he looked his future in-laws in the eye, managing, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, he had a scholarship. He had a game plan. Rosemary grinned like a cat. That was back when she was still part of his team. Even in the blur of the twins' first months, all she had to do was meet his eyes in the dim light of the nursery as she nursed one baby and he bottle-fed the other, and he would be overcome by a terrifying sense of cheer, as though together they made up a task force forged expressly for the purpose of fighting desperation. They came to El Paso, 
the glory of NAFTA paving his way at last toward the stock portfolio of his dreams. Then Jordan, 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 accidental Jordan, who from her first moment had been a force with which none of them was prepared to reckon. The morning she was born, he'd taken the long way home from the hospital on the frontage road beside the river and pulled over. He'd been lightheaded as he shuffled from his vehicle to the chain link fence, uncertain of what he was looking for. A wide, dusty incline of creosote pimpled rock rose up at his back to where the railroad tracks lay. Above that, the freeway rumbling with early traffic and the university looming at mountainside, its red roofs like square hats. Before him, the river was free of the concrete bed that bound it for much, much of the length of the city, and it was running muddy and low. He released an unsteady breath. Eight years out on the open highway of parenthood, only to find himself now back on the doorstep of that soul-fracturing, gutted sleep, the mountains of diapers and snot wipers, the long, long, tantrum-filled march toward kindergarten, already itemized with expenses and delays for the next 18 to 25 years. His new child had smelled of blood as she squalled in his arms and had felt like a very ripe peach. It was then that he noticed a man in the distance. A boy, actually. He stood almost opposite Huck on the Mexican side at River's Edge, no barbed wire on his side, of course, pitching stones into the murk. Behind him, a low graffiti-slicked cinder block wall held back the familiar clumped shacks, which seemed to be trying but not quite managing to arrange themselves in straight lines. Huck watched the boy leaning, his arms slicing the air again and again, the explosive splash of each rock. He watched until the boy lowered his arm and looked up. The boy raised his hand to wave. Huck raised his hand in return, a swift cur current of optimism rising within him before the sun flashed against a tin roof and everything was lost in the glare. If only he could have gotten Rosemarie's attention the same way. It was though she too had vaporized in the dazzle of the weeks that followed. Of course, she was busy with the baby, with only one to wrangle this time around. She was brilliant with the care and feeding. It was only natural, but still he would wake in the night as though yanked by a cord summoning him to a task he could no longer define. He'd stumble out to find the baby already fed and asleep and Rosemarie hair brushed and in her pink silk robe, pouring through a volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica. He once asked her groggily, you studying for a test on the letter P? She didn't look up. She only muttered, I'm trying to learn something I don't already know. Huck, Rosemarie had said to him night before last, I would like to know, right this instant, right stinking now, what your feelings are on the matter of a separate vacation. Then she stopped her leg lifting exercise until he knew she until he knew he had to look. All right. Here was his wife of 19 years, a woman who is definitely still good to look at. Her hair lay in a damp gold slick against her neck. Freckles on the part of her chest she referred to as her décolletage peeked from the lacy thing under her bathrobe. The skin at her temples was pinched. Her dark eyes glowed electrically. Want rose from her in, all, in an almost palpable cloud. What he couldn't stand from where he hungered at his center was his implication in that want, nor his sudden thought, similar to the way he might regard a suspiciously dated carton of milk, of what it would be like to open the door of that want this time. Just a crack. Huck? Just talk about it in the morning, he mumbled into his pillow. Huck! He awakened the next morning with a pressing opinion that what she needed was a hobby, not a vacation, though she should still go if she wanted. She appeared to receive this diagnosis well. In fact, she released an abrupt throaty laugh as though she had discovered something perfectly absurd, which of course all of this was. With release, relief seeping through him, he joined her. Whatever the laugh meant wasn't the point. If she knew what she wanted, she should say what it was. What does it mean when everyone you know is harboring some kind of hidden agenda? And what the hell is that thing looming over him? He can feel it now, slithering, slithering under his chin in his armpits. And as it opens its vast sucking maw, he understands that it is stronger than he is. He lunges for it. He tries to throttle it, but it squirts through his fingers everywhere it no nowhere at once. And then he's jerked from the water and laid out on a warm slab of pavement. Dad! Quinn leans in with a wrinkled forehead. Holy crap! Skyler and Jordan lift their necks like gophers. His lungs seize in his chest. He hacks, rolls onto his side. Dad, Jordan says, you've got some algae on your face. Yes, he thinks as he probes his numb cheek. Yes, he does. So that's one of our uh, main characters. Um, let me briefly bring you um, into the world of his neighbor. This will be a slightly shorter excerpt. Um, incidentally, it's from a chapter um, called The Brown Invasion. In the bronze light of late afternoon, as Jerry Gonzalez stands at the French doors overlooking his deck, Chavela gives her orders. 
the coffee table, she says. Make sure you use two tablespoons of wax. Just two, only two, top to bottom, never in circles. It's an antique. Si, sí, senora, is the response. Jerry glides to the landing at the top of the stairs and peeks over. The heavyset woman whom Chavela addresses stands with her back to him in the kitchen, her black bun drooping, the waistband of her pants bunching beneath her t-shirt. She drifts between feet in bread loaf sized athletic shoes. Chavela with her pixie cut, her pink blouse, her pantsuit, the color of ashes. También las ventanas, por favor, she adds, tapping the bottle of Windex on the kitchen island. The woman nods, for she is the maid. The maid. There's no way in hell he's addressing this woman as tú. Dad, calls a voice behind him. Can I take one of the cars? Adam, their son, pokes his head from his bedroom. Black attire as ever, orange stripes in his hair, eyebrow with ring inserted, without permission in which he is required to remove in the presence of his grandmother. Where? Adam shrugs. He's developed a theory that matriculated seniors shouldn't have to explain everything. He's focused mostly on packing things into duct tape boxes in anticipation of the day his parents will drive the 700 miles to San Diego to deposit him at a dormitory's doorstep. God forbid he should attend El Paso's serviceable university where it so happens his father recently achieved tenure, but Adam desires new experiences and opportunities. He wants to see more of the world. Of course, Jerry has encouraged this curiosity. Of course, both he and Chavela want only what's best for him. Although, if this were completely true, Chavela wouldn't have spent the past two weekends angrily cleaning out the garage. Take the Volvo, Jerry says now. Return by midnight. Adam grins. Thanks, viejo. He disappears. Jerry returns to his desk, his embossed tome, Sons of Oñate, modern colonialism in the so American Southwest. From downstairs comes a surprised female gasp, followed by the yapping of a small dog. He oozes back out of the room. Javela's Pomeranian dances on its hind legs. Ay, Paquito! Javela stoops down and tickles him under the chin. She extracts a dog biscuit. Her voice rises an octave. Who's my good boy? Are you my good boy? Yes, you are. And the biscuit is snapped up in midair. She looks up from the floor. Te gustan los perros? The maid is practically standing with one top foot on top of the other. Si, senora. Adam breezes into the room, car keys jingling. Hi, sweetheart, Chavela says, rising. Say hello to Lourdes. What's up, Lourdes? Chavela gives him a narrow look. Hola, he says. Chavela shakes her head as Adam snatches a Coke from the refrigerator and slips out. Y tú? She glances over her shoulder. Tienes hijos? Lourdes nods. The coffee table, Chavela says. Top to bottom, not in circles. Never. It's streaks. It's an antique. And by the way, there's a sandwich in the refrigerator for you. Muy bien, señora. Gracias. Chavela makes her gathering sounds, papers, keys, sunglasses. Senor Gonzalez is upstairs, she says. He'll be home for the summer, researching, writing. In any case, he knows you're here. She pauses as though to let this information sink in. And I myself will be back in a few hours. Goodbye. Jerry cracks open Santa Oñate. He whaps it shut. He descends through a rising aroma of pine saw into the kitchen where he comes upon the maid herself, a dowdy vision in rubber gloves and 70s era headphones from which are emanating the sounds of a soccer game at tremendous volume. She stands at the sink with her back to him, filling a bucket with hot water. Welcome back, booms the announcer to the mid-season game of the Primera División and it's shaping up to be the biggest game yet of 2005. Chivas have the ball. He watches coolly as she moves the bucket to the floor and scrubs the sink. Foul on Bautista. Mar Marquez get the penalty kick. Chivas take possession at midfield. Medina passes to Avila. Avila to Aguayo. But no, Chivas recapture. And Vermeulen, the Belgian, takes the ball. He's closing in. He shoots. See, see, see. She chants at the ceiling. Goal! Pede poste. She hisses through her teeth. Me lleva. Buenas tardes, he calls out. She startles and whirls around to face him. Ay, perdón. She shuts off her headphones and removes them, blushing. Buenas tardes, señor. He forces a smile. Usted se llama Lourdes, no? Her dark complexion models as she nods at the window over the sink. Does he think he does she think he's making fun of her by speaking to her as an equal? He has no idea. He removes a casserole dish of macaroni and cheese from the refrigerator and inserts it into the microwave, then snatches up the remote from the kitchen island. The TV squawks to life in the den. The news is nattering on again about the fence. Every bit of disconnected chain link and barbed wire along the border converted into a 700-mile wall of concrete and steel. Brownsville to San Diego, in theory. Also, the war in Iraq. Some new mid-occupation iteration of the United States invading somebody, bombing somebody, installing somebody, evading somebody. He zaps the TV off. 
Remind me of how often we'll be seeing you, Lord, this. Twice a month, senor. The microwave beeps. She mops. Well, he says. He locates a Diet Coke and fills the glass with ice. Have fun. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Alma, and thank you, Ashley. Um, we're so excited to hear you both talk a little bit. So we're going to pass it over to our moderator, Amy, who's going to lead a conversation with you both. So take it away, Amy. I I loved both of the passages that you picked, and I feel like they do such a great job introducing us to these characters and letting us know a little bit more about them and where they all fit into the worlds that you have both created. Um, so I'd really like to start us out with a question that hits at the theme of um, a lot of the content of your novels and of this panel. Um, so what does family mean to you and how has the through line of family influenced your work? Alma, do you want to start? Who, me? Um, well, I mean, you know, Family means can mean a great many things, as we know. It can be the family that we're born to. It can be the family we create around ourselves. Um, sometimes um, those connections express themselves in surprising ways, um, it, which is certainly the case um, in, in my novel. Um, I honestly didn't even know I was writing what essentially were a couple of family intertwined, intertwined family stories um, until I was pretty deep into the process. And I realized, oh my goodness, this really is about not only, um, well, it's, you know, it's, these are about family stories and about how different families are connected to each other, but also what their family relationships mean in terms of the larger backdrop, in terms of the larger global concerns that they're dealing with largely unconsciously throughout the novel. Yeah, I think I I had a similar dynamic at work in my book where, you know, these two sisters, they are um they are a family but they also kind of each represent different things. And so for me, one of the challenges of writing this novel was making sure that they um that they were being depicted as sisters and as people and not just as symbols of their respective like political standpoints or points of view. Um, so like Jada is established very early on as, you know, college educated and more liberal, um, more living a more well-off life in her adulthood than she did in her childhood. Um, and like at peace with her abortion decision. And Maddie is still like very much um, ensconced in this, uh, a rural setting similar to the one where I grew up that is a little more conservative and she's influenced by, um, you know, both her sister kind of to her left and um, other people in her orbit who are kind of coming at her um, from the right. And since Jada makes her choice at the very beginning of the novel, Maddie is the one that we're we're left to watch actually make that choice on the page. And so we feel her being influenced by all these different people, one of whom is her sister. And so it was hard sometimes to not just let these two sisters turn into mouthpieces for some sort of, you know, political debate or ideological debate, but to make sure that they um, they were being sisters first and foremost, and that their relationship, you know, was at the heart of the novel and that the politics kind of raging around them are, are secondary to that family relationship. That's great. Thank you both. Um, that kind of segues into the next question. Um, I'd love to hear you both speak on the influence of class and the intersectionality that comes to that in both of your works. I found it very interesting that both have these domestic workers, um, people who are working in homes and having access to other people's lives or different views than other people will have of them. Um, so I'd just love to hear both of you speak to that. Well, you know, if, if if you don't mind me starting, um, <laughs> I I think that in the from the earliest moments of this um, 
book's inception when I understood that, oh, yes, I actually am centering this story in, in El Paso because it wasn't clear to me at first where I was. Um, I, you know, I understood very clearly that this is a world that um, maybe not a lot of people understand, and especially because this this book took much longer to write than maybe is typical. And during the time that it that I was writing it, El Paso went from a place that um, nobody knew much about. A lot of people may not have heard of it. Um, and it just was not really a blip on the national consciousness to absolutely transforming itself into this place that was the epicenter of the news again and again in every possible way. And I became very conscious as someone who is deeply immersed, you know, has been deeply immersed in this world and is still deeply connected to it, even though I don't live there anymore, that there is so that what gets left out of the news is the nuance of the actual human lives who are that are being lived there. And so it was very important to me to kind of portray, you know, some of the unique personal worlds that are going on there. Um, in particular, and this is a place where more than one culture comes together. And it's very easy for people, for outsiders to have stereotyped ideas about who are these people and what are their concerns and what do they deal with on a daily basis. And um, there is, there are constantly issues of class going on, no matter what the culture is. Um, I think each family in this story, you know, each family which is dealing in its own familial way with certain disruptions, um, uh, while the mother figure from family disappears in the Gonzalez family, a long lost sister appears and this causes further disruption. Um, there is a great deal, um, especially in the Gonzalez family to, to do with those class distinctions. You know, obviously we learn a lot about how this family came from very modest means and has arrived at a point where now they can have domestic help. And there's all kind. there's no unified response to that in this world, honestly. Um, some people are going to feel conflicted about it. Some people aren't. Um, and it's very, but it's very interesting when these, um, these friction points um, emerge and it's, it requires a great deal of nuance to, um, to unpack that for a reader who might feel like, well, aren't all of these people, you know, shouldn't they all be on each other's team? Not necessarily, not in real life. You know, there's a Mexican American border patrol agent in this book and that, that, presents a great deal of complexity and that's part of the and parcel of, of this world and so the, I, I was it was impossible to separate those ideas from the characters lives even as I tried to center just the characters lives and not their um not their social preoccupations mm -hmm. yeah yeah I mean I I think yeah obviously um Maddie in my book, you know, she cleans houses. Um, her mother, uh, before she died, also cleaned houses. Um, and I think like Maddie's class status as this like younger, um, accidental daughter who's never really ventured outside of the the small town that she came from, except to visit her sister at college. You know, I think she her class status is sort of expressed in the way that she struggles to imagine an alternative life for herself. Like in the passage that I read, I think it's like hard for her as someone who's been more isolated um, and, you know, who, who isn't as economically well off to imagine all these possibilities for how her life might go. Whereas for Jada as a character who, you know, started out similarly, but is now living a more privileged life, it's very easy for her to say, you know, I um, I don't want to become a, a parent right now because I want something else. And I know what that other thing is. And I know that it's available to me. Um, Maddie has, has trouble identifying like what that other thing is, right? Or what else she could do or be. Um, because she just hasn't seen it or been exposed to it in the same way that that her sister has, in part because of their different um, educational backgrounds. Um, so, yeah, I guess um, 
I thought a lot about how class is related um, also to, to place and to geography and to the kind of urban rural divide, which I explored a lot in this, in this book as the characters feel kind of, um, it, even Jada feels this kind of conflicting loyalty to her kind of rougher, like rural background and um, her up and this new like um, life of like a, a more affluent educated person that she's living now. And she in one world always feels a little bit like she's um, betraying the other or like there are these parts of herself that are intention or, or like she's kind of always faking it. Um, and I mean, that's something even that I have felt in my own writing career, like writing is sort of a fancy thing. Writers tend to be, you know, to, to be more privileged and to be more affluent because it's harder when you're, you know, when you are living a life that's more, more isolated and, um, maybe more poor to imagine like being an artist. It's not like you don't make money doing this. Um, and so as I've kind of moved along in my academic and creative career, I've also found myself, um, yeah, sometimes feeling out of place, like not belonging in, in this literary world where it feels like, um, I don't know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm an imposter uh, somehow. So that was something that that I wanted to explore for my characters as well. The imposter syndrome of kind of moving up or attempting to move up um, in the world. Thank you. I really like what you both said about the connections to place and how without the specific locations, these stories wouldn't exist um, in their forms that they are today. That's especially interesting. Um, I feel like especially at the crossroads of some of these things, as these characters are put into difficult situations, as they're grappling with really complex things, um, sometimes they'll make decisions that I as a reader or maybe other readers wouldn't necessarily agree with, or that took me to a place of more increased complexity. Um, I'm sure some of these characters made decisions that you're like, whoa, I wouldn't necessarily do that, or maybe I don't agree with that. But I felt like both of you handled um, all of these characters with such great compassion. And I would love to hear you speak about how just your process of writing complex characters or characters who make decisions that maybe stray from what you would do um, and just how you how you increased compassion for these characters through the eyes for the eyes of the reader feel free to go first Ashley okay have to be me. well yeah I have a lot a lot of thoughts about this um because you know I did give one of my two main characters a very big decision to make and um that was hard for me because it meant that I had like I had to make, you know, I ultimately am in charge. So I am, um, I can pretend like, oh, she just, you know, she made up her own mind. And and I do feel to a certain extent that she did, but ultimately, like, I also felt, well, the buck stops with me, like whatever I make her do, then it's going to mean something, or it's going to suggest something, or are people going to judge me based on the way my character, you know, uh, what my character chooses. And, and that was really, um, it was like a heavy weight to write from beneath because I did feel, and then I, I wrote an article about this actually for, for Lit Hub when my book came out last August. Um, I did feel this tremendous sense of responsibility to like try to make Maddie choose the way I thought she should or do the thing that I felt was the right choice for her. Um, and there were earlier drafts of this book where she made different decisions as I kind of felt my way toward the one that was ultimately going to be the right one for the book and the right one for her. And it took many drafts for me to get to a place where I felt like she was developed enough as a character that I didn't have to think about what she should do or what I thought she should do anymore because I knew who she was. And when I finally knew her that well, it felt very clear, you know, what she was going to do, whether I wanted her to or not, um, because, you know, I, I understood her well enough to know 
uh, what she wanted and needed and, and cared about and valued. And, you know, that led her to a decision that was not necessarily the one that I think she should make. Um, but yeah, letting go of the feeling that like, because I'm the author and because the subject matter that I'm writing about is so sort of um, almost like out of control <laughs> right now. And, and it's like the, this sort of fever pitch of like yelling and um, and and screaming and disagreeing. Like I just had to let go of the feeling that like, um, I had to let go of the, 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 my hangups about being judged for my character's choices. Um, and I think people do judge me and do judge her because we all think we know what's right for each other. But I guess if my book has a thesis, it's that only you know what's right for yourself and that um, really empowering women and embracing choice means letting people make the choices that they need to make that they feel are right for them and not imposing our own values or our own sense of justice on their choices. Um, but getting to the point where I could do that with Maddie was, was very difficult and took a long time and took a lot of work. And then, you know, the book came out, um, it was written before Roe v. Wade was overturned, but it came out after Roe v. Wade was overturned. So it was kind of born into this world where um, people were talking about this issue in whole new ways that they hadn't you know, been talking about it or arguing about it um, for like all of time before the summer of 2023. And so um, it's been weird also to have people evaluate my characters and evaluate their choices and evaluate the way they feel about their choices within this new you know, different world um, where their decisions like carry even more political weight than they did at the time that I was writing the book. Um, so I think there's so much pain and anger surrounding reproductive justice right now that um, I think yeah, I think it's hard sometimes for people to read my book and to make sense of my characters because um, we're all reading from the, from such a different place now. Well, I, I will say that similarly, if you ever want to feel like you're walking a tightrope, um, write a book that's set on the border and deals heavily with the ramifications of border politics, race relations, assimilation, um, all of the above. Um, and, you know, I, I, I also became very, I, you know, I, I was very clear that although, you know, when you're a writer's job is to let the characters do what the characters would do and not to infuse your work with any sort of agenda, um, because the, re the reader will smell that agenda a mile away. Um, but I think it's, it's really important to, um, to see where within the context of this world that your characters will go and to consider that they are human and that they are not always going to make good choices. Um, and they're not always gonna make choices that are aligned with your own choices. In fact, they that's probably the best sign <laughs> that you're on the right track is if they're not. Um, that's, that's the anti-propaganda um, uh, measure in some ways. Um, and, uh, you know, it was very important to me in many ways to make sure that people understood that so many of these circumstances that the characters find themselves in, whether conscious or unconsciously, um, are don't involve black and white moral moments. There is just so much um, to be found in the gray zone um, that is like really where our humanity lies <laughs> in many ways. I mean, yes, there are those stark moments where someone does something that is not a great thing or someone transcends something that's not great in a good way. Um, but it's mucking around in that gray zone is where we really find out who we are and what's important and how things could be different or might be different, or maybe it's too late to be different, but that's where the important information is. And I remember even having a conversation with, you know, I, I did consult um, 
I, I consulted with a board of, a former border patrol agent, a well-read former B border patrol agent who is nevertheless politically aligned in a certain way. And I said, look, I need you to know <laughs> that this is not going, this is not going to be a story of falling on saying, oh, these people are the good guys and these are the bad guys. Um, you know, whichever side someone might consider that, this is going to be about a lot of shades of gray and about people that are good people, sometimes put into impossible situations, sometimes making not great choices, sometimes making the choices that they have no other choice to make and then dealing with the repercussions. And sometimes they regret them and sometimes they try to uh, mitigate them and sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. And so, um, which was interesting because that, that former agent seemed accepted that and actually um, felt good about the book when he read it. And I was, I was like, I was relieved in a way because that was my goal because I, I think there was a lot of in there that someone like that could have taken um, exception to. Um, and what I have been waiting for is, you know, I, I have been waiting for it. Similarly, I, I wrote most of this novel, you know, starting when there was very little to pin it on in terms of the national consciousness. Things grew, obviously, but once the book was published, it was after things had exploded to the point that they were now. So obviously a very different perspective on it. I keep waiting for someone, I keep waiting for a shoe to drop. I keep waiting for someone to detonate <laughs> around those issues um, in some way or another, however they decide to take them in terms of how they're presented in the book. Hasn't happened yet. Um, possibly because in the the travel that I've done related to this book I've stayed I've had to stay in the in the southwest and I think that there what was heartening to me was that there seemed to be such a recognition of the famili familiarity of the kinds of characters that they were seeing the cultures the the concerns the larger social realities that people have have I think felt like there's enough depth and enough variety there that they don't need to freak out. But whether that's going to be the case <laughs> as you know, as the book reaches um, further and further away from from the border, it only came out in October. Um, that's a question that is that remains and that I will be prepared for, but um, that I hope will continue to play out in a really positive way. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting all that, that we both talked about taking a really long time to write, you know, uh, um, about things that were maybe rising to a boil, but not fully boiling mm -hmm. as we were going through that writing process. And I think it's probably good for both of our books that they were written then and not now. Because, I, I mean, I, I totally agree with what you're saying about like, there shouldn't be propaganda. Um, we have a responsibility to dwell in these difficult, complex gray areas. And, and I really believe that. But I think we also are in a time and place where a lot of people want propaganda and a lot of people really don't like gray areas. And so, um, you know, literature that that insists on fulfilling its responsibility of dwelling in those areas is you know, not always, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea right now. But I do think that that is ultimately literature's obligation is to rise, like to shut out the noise and not be part of the noise. Um, but yeah, it's hard in a, in a moment where, um, yeah, um, I think, I think people, people are, are struggling with that a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think one one thing that I think one smart thing I did um, as a novelist was that I it occurred to, to me at a certain point um, while drafting the book that I couldn't set it in the present day because the realities, the, polit the, re the political realities were shifting so quickly that every time I tried to pin it to the now, the now kept changing. Every time I tried to find the, the locus of what's happening in this moment, it just, it would change. And so it, I, I said, okay. And in fact, land, entire landmarks in the cityscape were disappearing that are like, were part of the plot. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> let's uh, change the plot or, oh no, let's, uh, let's work this into the plot. And so I said it, I ended up setting it in 2000, 
2005, um, 2005, 2006, at a time where, you know, post 9-11, um, when things were really starting to change at the border. Um, and I feel, you know, it, it really created this very resonant sense for me of like, this is, this is the, this is the, not just the background, but the foreground, this is the foreshadowing of, we could have seen this coming, the, the, the stage was set, um, and there's so much we could have learned from the past now, what can we learn from now when it becomes the past in the future? Mm -hmm. I am completely blown away with the nuance that both of you handled these incredibly difficult and just very like politically fraught topics with, um, I don't know, very, very completely blown away and taking lots and lots of notes for my future writing. Um, we are going to have one more question uh, before we sign out. And I would just like to ask you what advice you would give to future novelists and people who are working on their first books right now. I would say um, <laughs> be patient which I'm not a patient person. And this is the thing that I've struggled with, struggled with most um, as a writer, especially when writing a novel so with stories, you don't have to be as patient because they're so small and contained and you can kind of visualize how they're all going to come together you know, before you even set out to write them. And then you've got, you know, your 10 to 25 pages and you're done. But with a novel, something that's so, um, large and unwieldy, uh, it really requires an enormous amount of patience with the work and with your characters and with yourself. And so I think I went into the novel writing process thinking that it was going to be just like a big short story. And it wasn't like that at all. It was a completely different animal. Um, and I think, um, in some ways I'm glad that I didn't know, or I didn't, fully realize how hard it was going to be or how long it was going to take me or how frustrated I would become um, because that, that might have deterred me a little bit. But now I feel like when I go, uh, if I go and write a novel again, I'll have a much more realistic sense of what that process is like. And I've learned, yeah, to, to have patience with myself and um, my ideas and, you know, uh, the narrative itself like it's okay if it takes a long time it doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong or that you're failing at it it's it just means that it's big and and um and that's okay uh yeah i i would definitely say that um if you're going to tackle a novel um patience is required and i think that where a lot of people get stuck and you, you know i i'm speaking from the personal pain of the fact that this manuscript was originally a collection of linked stories and I had to scrap it after several years and start over. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of people I think get stuck in thinking like, oh, this, I don't know what to write. And it's no, I'm thinking about this and I don't like it and it's not good enough. And um, what do I do? What do I say? Um, my first advice is um, the only way around it is through it, <laughs> and sorry for some extra background noise, but um, sometimes you just have to sit in the middle of that discomfort and write something anyway. Um, lower your standards <laughs> and write something anyway, um, because I've, I've also heard it said that um, done is better than good. Um, and sometimes you just really have to trust the process that you can say it can be bad. It can be bad at first. It can be as bad as it needs to be until you're done. And then you can go back and then you make it a little better and then you make it a little better. Um, but, you know, try my, my you know, I, I, I have told people this before um, that if you are focused on, well, I need to get this book done and I need to get an agent. I need to sell it and I need to be an author. Um, that will, nothing will kill you quicker um, because <laughs> there's no guarantee of success in, in our writing lives. The success, the meaning is in the writing itself and that you have to focus day by day on the satisfactions and the victories and the challenges that you get out of it every day um, because that's what's going to sustain you in the long term rather than the end point that might or might not arrive when you think it should. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And when it does arrive, maybe it doesn't even feel the way you think it's going to feel. Like, I think I, as a very young writer, imagined that um, when my first book came out or when my novel came out, there was going to be just this feeling of euphoria, unlike anything I had ever known before. And it would be like this pure, I don't know, moment of like bliss or sense of that, that everything had paid off somehow. And it does feel really good to to publish a book, but also publishing a book is totally different than writing a book and is fraught with its own issues and challenges and frustrations. And um, it's not a joy that's pure in the way that I once thought it might be. And so I really have learned not just through writing, but through publishing that like the joy is in, like you were saying, Alma, that the everyday labor of like finding a phrase that I really love or just getting something down on the page and feeling accomplished because it wasn't there before and now it's there. And those those little like daily victories and the the pleasure in being in the language is what writing is all about. Um, and so I guess I feel that I've learned over the course of many years to appreciate those little those little joys and those little moments when they come, instead of thinking of them as building blocks towards something else that was going to be when I was really happy and real, you know, that was where the, the real joy was going to be. Um, I think I'm much better now at making writing be about the journey and not about some kind of imagined destination and I'm better off for it. <laughs> Yeah, I think every part of the journey has its gifts to offer you, whether it, they're positive or negative. And that's where we have to focus to to stay sane and to just be able to keep creating. <laughs> Thank you both so much. I really enjoyed talking to you and you're both so incredible. I am in awe of both of you. Well, thanks so thanks, much. Thanks, Amy. For, for <laughs> yes, thank you. And thanks so much for having us. I'll thank hand you. it back over to Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for handing it back over. Um, you did such a great job with that conversation. So thank you. Um, it was great to get a taste of both of your novels, Ashley and Alma. Thank you so much for sharing uh, the work with us and talking about your process and some of the decisions that you made um, with these novels and with your characters. Um, we really love events that help us learn and have important conversations. And your books definitely help us to do that. So thank you. Um, and again, thank you, Amy, for leading the conversation. And thank you, Alma, for also being with us in person this year. If you're watching at home, um, you might have gotten a chance to take a class with Alma on using humor in her fiction. Uh, so I hope that you are all able to attend that. I would also like to thank Liz, our assistant coordinator for the festival, and all of the other student interns. Amy also is a student intern. So thank you, Amy, for your work throughout the year uh, on putting together Get Lit. Um, Let's see, for everyone watching at home, if you would like to learn more about these writers, you can visit our website, getlitfestival.org. Remember that these virtual events are all free to access on our YouTube channel, along with dozens of events from previous festivals as well. If you'd like to join us next year in 2025, which will again include both in-person and virtual events, please consider sending us a submission from May 1st through September 1st at getlit.submittable.com. Thank you again for joining us, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank